Hey, my name is Nick Breeze, and I'm a new media artist slash educator slash organizer living and working in Chicago, Illinois. And this is an intro video of what I hope will be many tutorials slash essay videos on how to, but very importantly, why make internet art. The internet is amazing, and it's changing every day. This series is an invitation call for artists, makers, creators to join the conversation and help influence the development of what has become one of the most insane milestones in human history. This is a series for creative folks that want to make contemporary work, meaning art with and informed by the technologies defining the age we're living in. This all might sound a bit lofty, but ultimately this is a series for beginners. So while we'll be tackling some big ideas, we'll be starting at the very beginning. What's the internet? What's the web? How do I make things with HTML, CSS, JavaScript? Why does it all work the way it does? Who does it work that way for? Am I cool with that? How might I make work that speaks to this, work that affects this? These are the sorts of questions I'll be addressing in these videos, which will be at the same time technical tutorials and theoretical essays. Allow me a couple minutes to elaborate. Though I'd argue that making work with and about the internet and computers is contemporary, I wouldn't say it's new. In fact, the creative potential of computers was written about in the 1840s by Ada Lovelace, who, by many accounts, was the world's first programmer. In her notes describing the workings of what would have been the first computer ever, The Analytical Engine by Charles Babbage, she wrote the world's first computer program and also describes the computer's potential relationship to art, specifically how computers could be programmed to produce new kinds of music. Which is not surprising, considering that since the invention of the first drawing utensil, art has by and large been enabled by technology. But despite this fact, we don't normally associate computers with art, or rather we generally accept that computers evolved outside of artistic contexts in fields like science and mathematics. Still, the history of these technologies is a history of creative individuals who may not have necessarily identified as artists, collaboratively shaping one of the most important narratives of our time. And occasionally, some of the most radical ideas would in fact come from self-identified artists. I, as an artist, have to bring to it the imagination, intuition, and emotion that I would bring to any work of art. If you're an artist and, and you're skilled with media, this is a new medium that offers great control, turning off. There's a thousand little dots in half an inch, and you have the capacity, either real or magnified, to turn off and on each one of those dots. So in a screen that's fairly big, or a piece of paper, eight and a half by 11, you've just got so many scads of dots. There's nothing, really, that you can't present on that screen. But it was when the internet, and perhaps more importantly the web, were invented that artists really started to flock to this new media. And as a creatively inclined and contemporary-minded person, how could you not? Because, as internet artist Raphael Rosendahl explains, I think if you would tell Leonardo da Vinci there's this magical box that anyone in the world can access and they can also talk to you, and you can work with color and with sound and with interaction and with movement, and any time of the day you can change whatever and you can, anyone in the world can see it for free, I think he would be pretty excited. And though Rosendahl's work might not be my personal cup of tea, if you're a creator or artist of any kind, it's hard to deny what he said. And that might be reason enough to begin exploring the exciting world of internet art, but there are arguably even bigger reasons. Take a moment to consider this deceivingly simple question. What is the internet? Go ahead and pause this video for a sec if you need to think about that. One of the most interesting answers to this question comes from a group of some of my favorite internet artists which call themselves critical engineers. They define the internet as a deeply misunderstood set of technologies upon which we increasingly depend. Now, it's obviously not the dictionary definition, but it raises an important point. The internet is much more than an exciting new medium. Computers and the net have woven themselves into the fabric of our lives. And as a result, it makes sense to consider these technologies not simply as tools we use, but environments we're living in. And the key to making powerful internet art is really understanding what this means. We call this fundamental understanding digital literacy. And that's ultimately what this whole series is about. The, the government has the capacity by using computers to get all kinds of information on us that we're really not even aware that they have. Isn't that dangerous? Well, I think the best protection against something like that is a very literate public, and in this case, computer literate. And I think you're actually seeing that happen right now. Let's talk about this word literacy for a sec, the ability to read and write. It doesn't seem like a very impressive skill, but consider for a moment what your day would be like if you couldn't read or write. What was the world like before anyone could read or write? Before the invention of the technology of the written word? 
In his book, The Information, author James Gleick explains that literate people take for granted their own awareness of words along with the array of word-related machinery, classification, reference, definition. Before literacy, there was nothing obvious about such techniques. Later in that book, he goes on to explain that the ability to logic and reason came only after we internalized this new technology. Think about how the ability to write down your thoughts and then return to them days later can drastically change your perspective on those thoughts. Or how reading someone else's thoughts, say from another city or another country or even another time period, might change your outlook on the world that you're living in. In his aptly titled book, Program or Be Programmed, Douglas Rushkoff explains, in the long run, each media revolution offers people an entirely new perspective through which to relate to their world. Language led to shared learning, cumulative experience, and the possibility for progress. The alphabet led to accountability, abstract thinking, monotheism, and contractual law. The printing press and private reading led to a new experience of individuality, a personal relationship to God, the Protestant Reformation, human rights, and the Enlightenment. With the advent of a new medium, the status quo not only comes under scrutiny, it is revised and rewritten by those who have gained new access to the tools of its creation. Today, dare I say it, we're living through another such revolution, and those who gain access to the tools of its creation will in turn change the world we live in. Because technology, be it something small like a file format or something large like the internet, is never neutral. They're biased. They are reflections, consciously or not, of the folks who produced them. The staircase is biased towards people who can walk. The book is biased towards people who can see. Many programming languages are biased towards English speakers. And these biases say a lot about the politics and worldviews of their inventors. Someone working on new hydraulic fracking techniques might view the world as something to extract energy from, while those working on new wind turbines may see the world as something to create energy with. Both these technologies are means to the same ends, energy, but both are reflections of different worldviews and as such have different side effects. I totally admit and realize these are gross oversimplifications. I'm not interested in starting a debate over accessibility issues or climate change or anything like that. My point is simply that technologies are not neutral. They're embedded with the biases, intentionally or not, of the folks who've produced them. Now, take that idea into consideration when I say that the technology of our day, computers and the internet, aren't just tools, but rather environments. This is what Marshall McLuhan, one of the most important media theorists of all time, was constantly trying to explain to us. If you were around today, he'd probably say, it doesn't much matter what you post on Twitter. The app as a service is a huge environment, and that is the medium. And the environment affects everybody. What you post on Twitter affects very few. And the same with Facebook and any other app. What you post is nothing compared to the effect of the social media post. Social media sets up a paradigm, a structure of awareness which affects everybody in very, very drastic ways. And and it doesn't very much matter what you post so long as you go on with that form of activity. In her book, Close to the Machine, computer programmer and novelist Ellen Ullman echoes this point. I'd like to think that computers are neutral, a tool like any other, a hammer that can build a house or smash a skull. But there's something in the system itself, in the formal logic of programs and data, that recreates the world in its own image. We think we are creating the system, but the system is also creating us. We build the system, we live in its midst, and we are changed. Truly understanding what this means, that's digital literacy. This series is an end to that conversation for folks who want to help shape that conversation because the internet and the web aren't finished products. This conversation is not over. Like most things new media, they exist at least presently in a state of perpetual beta, meaning that they're constantly evolving. These technologies are versioned with future versions in desperate need of more diverse, critical, and creative perspectives, the kind I'm hoping you will bring. And again, this might all sound a bit lofty, but the digital literacy required is really just a few tutorials away and some serious studio time and experimentation. I'll end on the words of a computer guy who I usually adamantly disagree with. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again.